How many of you have enjoyed our, our season sermon series? Amen? Amen. Amen. It has, been, it has fed my soul. I'm so grateful to our team. I just feel like God has been speaking, and I've talked to several people who have told me, wow, this is, this is just what I needed. This is just where I've been at, and, and this was a timely word. And so I'm just so grateful for everybody who has stepped in and, and shared the word of God. And so today, we're actually going to close out our season series uh, we're going to close it out, and today we're going to talk about a season of blessing, a season of blessing, because here's the thing. We know that God works through seasons, but it's not because God can't make up his mind. It's because God knows that we need different seasons to shape us so that we can be the people of God and so that we can get to the place where he wants us to be. And so he's not making it up as he goes along. Sometimes in my life, I've been in a bad season. I thought, man, God, what are you doing? But the truth is, and we said this in week one, there are no throwaway seasons. There are none. The season you're in right now is significant. It's important. But it's not permanent because God is on the move because God wants to bless you and he wants to strategically put you in a place of destiny because there's a plan and there's a purpose behind it all. And so today we're just going to unpack that a little bit in seasons of blessing. So would you bow your heads one more time? Father, we just invite you. We just invite you in this moment. Lord, would you speak to our hearts? God, with all that's going on, the most important thing is that we see you that we hear you. And so Lord, we just open our hearts today and we ask you to speak to us through your word. Lord, not just so we can be hearers only, but God, we wanna be doers of your word and we can't be doers unless you transform us, unless you shape and mold us, unless you help us today. So Lord, give us eyes to see and give us ears to hear what the spirit is saying to the church. In this moment, we pray in Jesus name. Amen, 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 amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Seasons of blessing, seasons of blessing. So last week, Pastor Jimmy talked to us about Joseph and what happened. And when I think about Joseph, when I think about his life, the most ready metaphor that comes to mind for me is a roller coaster, a roller coaster. And, and I don't mean one of those kitty roller coasters you may have ridden with one of your kids or for those of you, how many like roller coasters? Yes, yes. Well, for those of you who really don't, you, you can get on a kitty roller coaster and still tell your coworkers, hey, I ride roller coasters. I got on a roller. You, you can say, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about one of those roller coasters that will like make you think you may not make it. Like I'm talking about the ones with like hairpin turns and corkscrews and the ones where the, the ascent up is like so slow, you're like, and you just feel it in your stomach as you anticipate. And then all of a sudden this ridiculously huge drop and you're like crying out to Jesus just to take you right then. That's what I'm talking about. And when I think about Joseph's life, that's what it's been like. We've been in his life now for four or five weeks or more. And we've, we've, we know that he started out in Canaan with his father. He had 11 brothers and, and he was the favorite of his father. But then because he was so hated and despised by his brothers, they plotted against him um, and they actually were going to kill him, but instead sold him to traitors that were passing through the land. And, and here Joseph is going from one of the most backwards, simple societies, and he's thrust into the, one of the most advanced societies of all Egypt. And he's a slave on the slave block, and he's so far from the favor of his father. And then if that wasn't enough, he's bought by, by Potiphar, and, and those, those magic words appear, and the Lord was with Joseph and God began to bless him. And you know, when we talk about blessing today, I don't want you to get it confused. You can be blessed going through a hard time. Like blessing does not mean that, that you don't have anything going on. God can bless you in any season. 
And so Joseph was in Potiphar's house and God is blessing him and he doesn't even realize God's preparing him. But then Mrs. Potiphar cast her eyes on him and she wanted him and he, he constantly day after day had to say no to temptation and finally that lust uh, became hatred and, and she accused him falsely of, of rape. And so now Joseph who did the right thing is thrown in prison. And it's there in prison um, that no doubt he probably felt forgotten, and yet he comes in contact with two very important people, and while Joseph is suffering in, in the dungeon, he is also serving other people, and he's serving their dreams, even though God put a dream inside of his heart, and Pastor Jimmy talked about that those, those seasons of in-between, being in-between and really not knowing what's coming next, and yet God didn't leave him there. God didn't leave him. And listen, this week I was so excited to preach because, you know, last week was seasons of between. But, you know, we can't leave it there because God does not leave us in the in-between. He doesn't do it. The truth is that God wants to bless you, that God has a plan to prosper you, to promote you, to to use you. And and whether that be in little or in much, I I can tell you easily this morning that, that you are the one that God wants to bless. You're the one. And when God puts a dream in your heart and a dream in my heart, seldom do we get all the the details. And so sometimes we end up thinking it might be one thing and God has something totally different, but God is good. And so he, he wants to bless us. And so from last week until now, the last thing that we see is Joseph is out of prison and he's just been promoted. He's just been promoted and now he's on top and, and he's, he has received extraordinary blessing. Uh, there's no way he could have anticipated how big God set him up. Um, And so my question to you is this, as we think about that and unpack it this morning is, why do you think that God wants to bless you? Because you see, sometimes we look at other people and say, oh yes, I can see clearly God would want to bless them. Or maybe because look, they've, they're, they're so good or they've been faithful or, or they've been in church all their life or, you know, what, whatever the case may be. But sometimes we have a hard time believing that God would actually want to bless us. And so I want to say it again for emphasis. God actually wants to bless you. He wants to bless you. Not just the person to your left or right, but but you. And so I want to give you three quick reasons why God wants to bless you. The first one is easy. It's just his nature. It's just the nature of God that he wants to bless you. It's his heart. God is a good father. He's a good parent, and any good parent, it gives joy. It's a thrill when you have the resources and the means, and it's good, and the timing when you can bless your children. Where do you think we get that from? It comes from God. It's just who he is. Do you know that when God created the earth, right after he created everything, do you know the first thing that he did? He blessed it. He pronounced, this is first mention principle, right? One of the first things he did after everything was said and done is he blessed his creation. Let's look at Genesis first chapter, verse 28 through 30. It says, God blessed them. There it is blessed and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. That's blessing. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. That's blessing. Verse 29, then God said, I give you, that's blessing, every seed bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. That's blessing. And verse 30, and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, and I give you every green plant for food. And it was so. God blessed his creation right there at the beginning. But you know, not only that, that's Old Testament. When you get over into the New Testament, when Jesus steps on the scene and he begins his ministry, Jesus actually, when he wants to describe what his kingdom is going to be like, the kingdom that you and I are a part of, he preaches this sermon that's the most famous sermon. It's the greatest sermon ever preached. How many of you know what it is? Sermon on the Mount. And what's one of the first words you see in the Sermon on the Mount? 
Blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are they, they who, those who mourn. Blessed are the peacemakers. And, and, and it's just one blessing after another blessing. What he's trying to get into us, although it, it was a very different kind of blessing that maybe they were looking for, is he, Jesus wanted the people who would join him to understand that it was God's heart to bless them. And not only that, but this week I was looking at the book of Revelation, did not know this. Did you know that actually there are seven blessings, official blessings in the book of Revelation? Seven? Um, I read through every one of them. Seven blessings. So not only at the beginning, but also right in the middle and at the very end, God wants to bless. And, and when I got done reading all seven, I noticed, do you know the last the very last verse of the Bible, so the last verse of the last chapter of the last book of the Bible uh, goes something like this, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. I don't know how that reads for you, but that sounds like a blessing to me. God is a God of blessing. It's just who he is. Not only that, but there's other reasons, and a second reason is I think God wants to display his glory in the earth through blessing. Do you believe that? He wants, listen, he wants our lives to be advertisements for his goodness. What is your life advertising to the world? Because God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be blessed so that everybody will know who he is. Psalm 67, an amazing psalm. Verses one and two says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine us. So right away, the psalmist is saying, may God bless us. Check out verse two, so that your ways may be known on earth and your salvation among all nations. The psalmist gets it. He said, God, we want to be blessed so that everybody will know who you are. It's not on the screen, but verse three he talks about so that people will praise God. Verse four, so that people will have joy. God wants people to have joy. He wants the inhabitants of the earth to live joyfully. He wants them to have equity, another verse says. He wants to guide their ways. And then the last verse is verse number seven. May God bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. That's the purpose. God wants to bless you and I because he wants to make his ways known throughout the whole earth. It's the greatest thing that could ever happen. He wants people to know him. But not only that, the third and last would be this. God blesses us because he wants to bless others. He doesn't just bless us just to bless us. He wants to bless others. Not so you and I can become spiritual hoarders. Not so that we can brag on ourselves. Not so we can become narcissists and think it's all about us. No, God wants to bless others. And so we're just the channels of that blessing. In Genesis 12, verses 2 and 3, God spoke to Abraham and he said, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And check this out. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Pastor Scooter said it several weeks ago, and I'm going to say it again. The blessing is bigger than you. Can you tell somebody today the blessing is bigger than you? It's bigger than you. So the question is, the question is not, does God want to bless you? The question is, can God trust you with his blessing? You remember the first week I ask you, can God trust you with trouble? But this week, can God trust you with his blessing? Can he trust you with success? Can he trust you with promotion? Because here's the irony. Many of us can deal better with a demotion than a promotion. Do you hear me? Like sometimes elevation could be the worst thing to ever happen to us in the wrong season. 
And it might sound strange, that might sound strange, like I felt a little shift there, but you do realize that more people are ruined by success than by suffering. Like, it's, it's true. Um, whether it be athletes, you, listen, you can find documentaries that go on forever, rock stars, celebrities, even lottery winners. Like, even if you don't play the lottery, you know you fantasized about it. And, and listen, you go check it out. Like, there's a couple of them that make it out okay, but, but the majority come back saying it's the worst thing that ever happened, right? It's the worst thing that ever happened. And so the same could be true for us. And, and if you don't believe that this morning, then let me just ask you a simple question. Do you pray more in pain or in pleasure? Okay, because in pain we cry out, like we cry out to God. But the temptation is when success comes, sometimes it can make us self-sufficient. And we forget God and, and we forget all about him and we focus on ourselves. And so, listen, I, I'm holding to that first principle. God wants to bless you. He really does. Okay, but the right things in the right season trusting him so that whether we're high or whether we're low, it's the same. We're giving him the glory and we're, we're praising him and keeping our eyes fixed on him. So in order for us to be able to handle some of the good things that God has in store, sometimes we have to be tested, right? Like we, we have to be tested. Like there's, there's no kindergartner that you've ever had in your house that their teacher said, you know what? You did so good on your primary colors, and I can see that you can count to 20 now, and you know your letters, uppercase and lowercase. You know what? You did so good. Let's just go ahead and, and put you in high school. Like, nobody does that, right? Nobody does that. It's, it's all about being tested, because before you can get to the next level, you got to be able to prove that you can handle what's coming next. Otherwise, you repeat it again. I say it a different way. For every blessing, there's a testing, I heard someone say. For every blessing, there's a testing. And that's actually to our advantage. That, that really is. Why? Because every good thing you see around you is not necessarily a God thing. Right? Like, just because it looks good doesn't mean it is good. And there are sometimes things that you and I can't handle yet, and so God withholds them, not because he's stingy or bad or because he loves other people more, but it's really because he's good. We must grow into them first. Think about this. You, if you've got a 12-year-old in, in your house and, and they said, hey, mom, dad, could you lay the keys on me? Uh, some of my friends uh, want me to pick them up so we can go to the movie theater. And so I, I'd like to take the car out. You'd, you'd say, yeah, that's a good one. Go along and play now, right? But isn't it amazing how just four years can make such a big difference? Four, four years and some some training and some driving and some whiplash on your part and, 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 and all the things that they have to go through. And when they get done, all of a sudden they stand and they take their picture and they hand them a piece of plastic and same keys, same kid. The only difference is time and testing, time and testing. And that is the way that our God operates because see Psalm 84 11 says this, no good thing Will God withhold from those who walk up rightly with him? If it's good and it's for you, he's not holding back on you. If it's really for you, if it's for your best, God doesn't offer second best. Sometimes it's just about the timing and it's just about the training. And so God in his mercy does that. And that's exactly what we see in the life of Joseph. You see, Joseph's life took a dramatic turn in moments. Pastor Jimmy said it last week, he was a prisoner and suddenly he's a, he's a prince. He's a prime minister over an entire nation. He's suddenly transformed. He's got a signet ring, which means he had authority. He has a, a clothing allowance. He, he just took off rags and now he's got a clothing allowance. He's got designer jewelry. He's got a, a custom company vehicle or, or a, um, he, yeah, <laughs> chariot. Thank you. He's got a new name. He's given a wife after saving himself. Like he's traveling in that 
chariot and everybody's bowing everywhere he goes. Like his dreams were so small that just a couple of people, son, and all of a sudden everybody's bowing to him. It's dramatic. And I, I look and say, wow, how did he handle that? I'll tell you how he handled it. He was ready in that moment because he had taken many tests before he was blessed. He had taken many tests before he was promoted to the top. And so this morning, as we think about that, again, remember for every blessing, there's a testing. He had already passed adversity and difficulty and patience, all of these things with flying colors. He did well, but this was a different kind of test. This was a test of prosperity. This was a test of influence. This was more than he could have ever dreamed about. And yet God knew he was ready and it was time. And so this morning, as we talk about that, I, I want to talk to you about test of blessings because when sudden success and prosperity and fame and influence come, it can either elevate you or it can destroy you. And God doesn't want to destroy you. Remember, he has a destiny for your life and it's different from anybody else. You may be where he's got you. It may be on your job. It may be in your neighborhood. It, it, wherever you are, God's plan is going to look different, but he's going somewhere with it. And so our job is to stay with him and to keep our eyes and just to trust him no matter what. And so this morning, I, I want to bring four exams under the test of blessings um, that you and I at some point will have to pass to get to the next level or, or simply rather than the level to get to the full destiny that God has for us. And so, so the first uh, exam that I want to talk about today is in the form of a question, and it's this, will you be faithful? Will you be faithful? You see, the test or the exam of faithfulness is not one that you and I can bypass. We, we don't get to skip this one. Um, it, it won't just appear suddenly. Um, faithfulness is something that must be developed over a long period of time. God is looking for people who will be faithful and obedient for a long time in the same direction. That's what he's looking for. And God has a future destiny, but it's funny because when it comes to faithfulness, Really, our future has a lot more to do with what are we doing right now. It's okay to have big dreams. Like if you're dreaming for God, dream big. You're probably not dreaming big enough because God's plans are bigger than our plans. But as you're dreaming about the future, don't forget that God is in the eternal now. And he's working now. And sometimes when we go through and we're in the middle of something, we think this is so insignificant. Actually, it's not. Actually, God wants faithfulness in the mundane things, in the slow times, in the little things, in the, in the times when nobody else is watching, God is watching. And it's not so he can punish us. It's just that we have to develop a spirit of faithfulness to him if we're going to be able to handle the good things that he can't wait to give us. And so he calls us to be faithful. Look at Genesis. We're in chapter 41, looking at the life of Joseph, beginning in verse number 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout all of Egypt. That's pretty significant. Verse 47, during the seven years of abundance, the land produced plentifully. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt, and he stored it in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Verse 49, Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Did you catch that? Joseph went to work. Joseph got busy. I mean, he just barely got his new clothes and his new chariot and his new wife. And you would think, hey, man, look, kick back. Take it easy for a minute. You deserve this. And what does he do? He's clear. He's clear that the blessing is bigger than him. He's clear that there's a mission before him. 
He's clear that God has called him to something bigger. And so rather than waste the moment, because you can work it or you can waste it, and he didn't want to waste it. And so what does he do? He immediately goes to work. And that is exactly what God was looking for. He's traveling throughout the entire land of Egypt because God spoke to him and said, there's a famine coming and there's going to be seven years of plenty. That was part of the dream. And so he took full advantage. God sent a man into the palace who would take full advantage of what God had told him to get ready for the next seven years, which were years of severe famine. And so when I think about Joseph, listen, he's in an enviable position. Who wouldn't want to be him, right? But there's a kingdom principle involved here. And I'm so grateful that we actually get to see the panoramic view of his life. We get to see it all, okay? It's important that we don't just see the palace. And here's why. Because it's just a kingdom principle that those that who are faithful with little will be given more. Look at Matthew 25 and 29. I'm reading in the New Living Translation. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. How many of you like that word? I like that word, abundance. God is a God of abundance. Don't ever believe differently. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now again, stepping back, Joseph just got, listen, not just the local county jail, he came out of a dungeon. He came out of a dark hole. He's just brought into the light and suddenly he has power, he has authority, he has prosperity, he has it all. His word is law. Don't you think Joseph could have cut corners? Like, don't you think he could have lived it up a little bit? In fact, don't you think he could have stolen from Pharaoh? Like, who would have seen it? He totally turned everything over to Joseph. Joseph could have embezzled on the side easily. Who would have seen it? The same one that was watching him in prison. The same one that was watching him in Potiphar's house. You see, he lived in the presence of God. And as a result of that, God knew that here was a man who was faithful no matter where he was at. And so Joseph went to work. So the question is this this morning. Will you go to work for God? Will you go to work for God? Not for you. God. Oh, I understand you may be self-employed. You may work for the county. You may work for the state. You may work for a large company. It could be any number of things. But what I'm saying is, do you realize really and truly when it's all said and done, you really work for him? That's why if you lose your job and you're being faithful, you don't really work for them anyway. God is your boss and he pays great wages and he'll take care of you. He's just looking for someone to bless. Listen, God is looking for people to bless. Second exam that you and I are given throughout the scriptures, it's evident in the life of Joseph, is this. Will you stay humble? Will you live a life of humility? Or I'll say it a different way. Will you live a life that constantly, repeatedly acknowledges God? The scripture says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. In all your ways. You see, Joseph is now in charge of all of Egypt. And he's an instant celebrity and he's famous. And not just nationally, internationally, because there's a big problem internationally. And he's the guy. And and the whole country is now dependent on Joseph and he's in the spotlight and you know being in the spotlight for too long sometimes can blind you right we can become blind we can start believing everything that everybody says about us and and we can begin to think that we can rely on ourselves and that we don't need the Lord anymore we see this throughout the scriptures throughout in the wilderness with the children of Israel when God would bless them and and they would forget the Lord and there's warnings Page after page, don't forget the Lord. And yet, here Joseph is, and God is looking for somebody that's going to stay humble no matter where they are. Somebody said it this way, stay humble or you will stumble. Stay humble or you will stumble. 
So what kept Joseph then? Because it really doesn't get much higher than that. He's second to Pharaoh, and he knows more about what's going on in the land than Pharaoh does. What kept him? It's simple. A God-centered life. You cannot walk in arrogance and have God at the center of your life. If God is at the center of your life, you're constantly reminded. I'm constantly reminded how desperately I need him. I say it often in prayer. God, you know without you, I'm over my head. Every time. Every time. Right? And so Joseph had a God-centered life. Now, where do you see that? Where do you see that? This is so beautiful. The same chapter 41, picking up in verse 51. Check it out with me. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, check this out, it is because who? God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. In other words, the things that hurt me so badly in the past. Actually, I'm not stuck anymore because God has made me forget my problems. He's helped me move beyond. Now, Joseph did not literally forget. He didn't get amnesia. What I'm saying is he didn't stay stuck. Check out verse 52. The second son he named Ephraim and said, it is because who? God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. Ephraim or Ephraim, actually, it, it sounds like the Hebrew word for twice-fold blessed or, or double blessed or double fruitful. And so every time Joseph, because look, he had an Egyptian name. He had an Egyptian wife. He's surrounded by lots of Egyptian reminders. But when it came to naming his sons, he said, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to do it old school. And every time he spoke their name, God was acknowledged. Every time he called their names, God was magnified. And he said, you know what? I just want to remember who put me where I am. God. God is the one that helped me not be stuck by my past. God is the one that set me free. God is the one who's blessed me. You see this chariot? You see this house? You see this ring? You see this robe? It wasn't because I was so good or wise or smart. God did it. Amen. How about you? How about you? I don't know about you, but I got a lot of blessings and I didn't earn them. Pastor Jimmy and I were talking yesterday, which I had a shirt that says, God did it. God did it. I'm telling you, you want to know the secret to success? God. God did it. That's right. Amen. 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 So the question is, will you and I stay humble every time we look? We need to name some things in our lives. We need to remember what God has done for us. And not only that, but we know Joseph was humble because not only did he enjoy the prosperity, but he actually served the land and he put other people first. Only a man of humility could do that. Isn't that becoming more rare? We're talking about somebody who had it all. And, and what did he use it for? What did he do with it? He learned to serve others who were lesser. He served others who were beneath him. He leveraged it. You know, we can lavish it when God blesses us. We can lavish it on ourselves or we can leverage it for the kingdom of God. And that is exactly what he did. By the way, side note, what happened to those dreams that, that Joseph had that he interpreted for Pharaoh, right? Seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. Well, they came true. There was a famine in the land. And I think it's so impressive. It's so interesting. It's so powerful that Joseph is one of the Old Testament types of Jesus Christ. He is. He is. It, it's, there's so many instances it's hard to count. Over and over and over, we see parallels. Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ. I was actually reading some commentaries. There are scholars that believe that his Egyptian name, I don't know if this is true, but there are several people that actually believe his Egyptian name actually meant savior of the world. Like, fascinating. There was a sore famine in the land, and here's Joseph, little savior of the world, 
And in Genesis chapter 41, verse 55, it says, when all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. And then Joseph told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. Everybody was in a panic because suddenly the, those years of abundance that they had become accustomed to disappeared and everybody's afraid. And so naturally they go to the, what they think is the number one man, Pharaoh. Hey, you got to help us out. And what does he do? He says, go to Joseph, turn to Joseph. You know why I love that? Because we're living in a famine right now, spiritually and morally in this country today. And we've got people that, that are not only committing suicide, but there's people that are looking for answers in all the wrong places. And you know, the thing is, we know the savior of the world. We know the one who has the answer. The answer is not in politics. It's not in legislation. It's not in better health care. It's no, no, no. Listen, Jesus is the answer for the world that we live in today. Amen. We get to point them to Jesus when people say, what am I going to do? The answer is simple. Go to Jesus. Third exam. Third exam is this. When God blesses you and exalts you, will you be generous? Will you be generous? This is a difficult thing. Because we live in the West. But God is looking for generous people, not stingy people. And the truth rises that we've said at least two or three times, God's blessing was bigger than Joseph. And we must beware because we can become hoarders instead of healers. And God has sent us in this world to take his healing to the nations and to our neighborhoods. Everywhere we go, when he blesses us, it's not so we can sit back and be fat and sassy. Come on. And that's fun. And God wants us to enjoy it. Side note, by the way, if God blesses you, you are free to enjoy it. Okay? Pressure's off. Enjoy it. But also use it and leverage it. And dare to ask him this question. God, what do you want me to do with this? I dare you. I dare you to ask him, God, what would you have me to do with this blessing? Because you see, God had a plan. Genesis 41, let's pick up at verse 56. When the famine had spread over the whole country, look at this. Now we're talking about generosity, right? And look, Joseph could have taken just his household or just Pharaoh's household, just the courtyard. But listen, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians but it didn't stop there. For the famine was severe throughout Egypt. Verse 57, and all the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe. Where? Everywhere. And so word got around that Egypt is the place to go. And it just so happened that God had slipped a man in through the back door because God wanted to bless the whole world and he was doing it through a generous man. Look at his life. Look at it behind closed doors. Look at it up close, if you will. There is no hoarding with Joseph. It says he opened the vaults. He opened it. He lived with open hands because Joseph knew where the blessing came from. It wasn't his to start with. And so he just had open hands, not just to people who were familiar, not just to his best friends, not just for his family or Pharaoh, but to strangers. And not just to strangers, but even to his own brothers. You see, the story is rich because those same brothers that were going to kill him, that ended up selling him, that betrayed him, and they listened to his cries from the pit as he, as he tried to bargain and beg his way out. And, and they saw him go into a land with no idea what they could have done to him. Those brothers... Those people, I'm not talking about the people that are nice to you. I'm talking about those people. He's good to those people because they came just like everybody else. Cain had experienced the famine and, and he's standing in line and they're counting as people come and bring their, their monies to get grain. And there they are. And all of a sudden they bow because they don't know who he is, but he knows who they are. 
And so they bow. And Joseph, in his wisdom, invites them in, but he doesn't reveal himself right away. He tests them. He puts them through a series of tests. Listen, I dare you to read the story. It is fascinating. Joseph is not only industrious, he is wise. And so he begins to test these brothers who were so self-centered and so hateful and so murderous, and he begins to put them through. And through that process, God begins to show him that through the hardness of life, their hearts have changed somewhat too. And so Joseph, not yet telling them who he is, sent them back because they asked for grain. He imprisoned them for three days. He threatened them. He called them spies. But then he said, I'll make you a deal. Because you see, they had left little brother, Joseph's actual blood brother, blood brother back home with, with dad. He said, I'll keep one of you here. You go back home. And when you bring your little brother, you prove that you're not spies. Bring him and then I'll help you even more. And so he holds one of the brothers back and they go back home. And what do they do? Their dad was like, no way. I've already lost one son. I've got the other favorite son here, Benjamin. And, and you left one back in Egypt and, and now you want to take him too? No. But you see, the famine was so severe that eventually all this stuff that Joseph gave them ran out. And there's this detail that I didn't realize, and I've, I've read and even taught from this story for years, but a little detail that in, in chapter 42, it says, verse 25, Joseph gave orders, this is the first time they came, to get grain. They brought money to pay for it. He gave orders to fill their bags with grain to put each man's silver back in the sack, okay, and to give them provisions for their journey. Don't miss that. There's a reason why the writer of Genesis wanted you to see that. Not only uh, in, in the rest of the verse, after this was done for them, they loaded their grain and their donkeys and they left. They had no clue because you see he had Egyptians come and fill up their sacks. They gave him silver. He gives a side note to the people filling the sacks and says, hey, that money over there, stick it back in their sacks. And you think that's, that's actually pretty generous, right? Yeah. Well, it was a long track back to Canaan. And so this little detail that, that Moses wanted us to see in Genesis, not only that, but it actually says he gave them provisions for the journey too. In other words, yeah, they had grain, but he gave them food and things to take back just to make sure for the trouble along their way. Same ones that didn't give a care about him. He doesn't just give them what they ask for. He goes above and beyond what he has to do. I'd call that generous. And when I think about that, I think about the God that you and I serve and how good he is to us. Why does God want us to be generous? Because he's been so generous to us. Not only has he forgiven us for all of our sins, but he's offered us a brand new life. Not only that, but he has supplied all of our needs. Not only that, but he's given us so many of our wants. And in return, here's what he asks us to do. Be generous. To be generous. Joseph could have sent them away with the bare minimum. Instead, he went above and beyond. And in a world where generosity is becoming more and more scarce, in a land of abundance that you and I live in, Sometimes generos or having abundance doesn't make us more generous. I mean, I've heard people tell me all my life, if I could just win the lottery, you know how many people I would help? But sometimes, I, I can't speak for you, but sometimes when I've had more, my natural instinct isn't spiritual at all. It's, I got to protect it. Somebody might take it away from me. I mean, now that I've earned all this, Right? And sometimes that's what can happen. And yet God wants to bless us beyond what we can imagine. He just wants us to be generous with it. In fact, it was said in one of the other sermons here, God wants to make us agents of blessing throughout the whole earth. Fourth and final exam, as we kind of come down for a landing today, is this. Will you show mercy? Will you show mercy? Because you see, God is looking for people who have been given so much mercy. And in return, he sends us out to our neighborhoods and college campuses and our jobs and the, our classrooms and to the people that we don't like and the people who don't appreciate us and the people who have used us. And God says, show mercy. 
You see, the brothers, when they ran out of food, had to come back to Egypt, right back to the source. And this time they had their little brother with them. Still not a clue that the man who was supplying them was the same brother that they had sold out years before. And Joseph, at the age of 30, as he began to test them and watch them, he began to see. And at one point in the conversation, because by the time he gets done testing, he actually hears them talking and their guilt is so apparent. They realize they're talking about him and they don't even know he's in the next room. And they said, all this, this bad stuff has come on us because of what we did to Joseph. And finally, Joseph is overwhelmed emotionally and he sends every, all the servants out of the house and he's alone with them and he cries out, I am Joseph. He takes off the mask and there's the one that they treated so badly. And this is where the story gets good because if you have never read it before, you're like, oh, this is it. This is where he gets his revenge, right? It is so tempting in moments like, listen, Joseph could have kept a list of all the people. He has the power now. He could have kept a list of the Rubens and the Dans and the Potiphar's and the cupbearers and you and I could do the same, but what happens when God blesses you? Joseph could have squashed him. One word, and they could have been executed on the spot. It's understandable that they were terrified because now they were in a pit of sorts, and he was on top. The tables had been turned, and it begs the question, what is he going to do with them? I'll tell you what he did. He showed mercy because Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ is the same one who forgave his brothers and sisters, you and I. Genesis chapter 50, last verse I'll read. Verse 19, but Joseph said to them, catch this, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. In verse 21, so then he says it a second time, don't be afraid, I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. You see, bitterness and blessing can't coexist together. That's why the Bible said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Joseph surrendered the right for revenge, and instead he modeled and passed all four exams, faithful, humble, generous, and merciful. And as a result, God blessed him beyond his wildest dreams. As the musicians prepare to come, I was thinking about, this is an ancient story in the Bible, I thought about someone who is a, maybe a little bit more modern to us. I've, no, I've known of him and admired him for years. He's actually a pastor in Southern California. When I call his name, you've probably heard of him. His name is Pastor Rick Warren. You may have even read a book that he wrote. It's called The Purpose Driven Life. But you may not know the story behind the story. You see, he, by that time, I think, had gone and been in Southern California pastoring for about 25 years. And God put this book on his heart. Strangely enough, the first line of the book is this. It's not about you. That's how it begins. It's not about you. And when he wrote this book, his publishers, a big publishing company, who were pretty smart people, came to him early on and said, listen, we've, we've done our homework and we've checked the forecast and what you may not realize is this book is going to be big. I thought, okay. They said, no, 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 you, you don't understand. When we say big, we're talking like multi-million dollar big. And you know what? They were right. Last time I checked, and I may be off by a year or so, for about three to four years, it was the best-selling book in the world, second only to the Bible. 
not just here, all around the world. Can you imagine how much money? And not only that, but prestige because suddenly he was getting phone calls from people that you see on television, not just the White House. Everybody wants to talk to Rick Warren from the Purpose Driven Life. But you see, he did something that when I heard this story, it moved me because back when he was told, before he ever got a dollar, he, prayed, he and his wife Kay prayed a simple prayer, and, and this is what they prayed. God, what do you want us to do with this? This money's your money. Obviously, you didn't send this much money, this kind of opportunity just for us. So what do you want us to do with it? He dared to pray it. And the Lord began to speak to him. And they made a decision before they ever got a dollar. Number one, they would not buy a new house. Same house they'd had for 25 years. They even decided they wouldn't buy new cars. So the first thing that they did, because he said, I decided I wanted to be a volunteer. He paid the church back for 25 years of salary. Second thing he did was he came up with a plan to bless the world. It's called the peace plan. You can look it up. To reach the most destitute and hurting people all around the earth, including the nations that were ravaged by AIDS. Whole villages were left with just children because all the adults had died off due to AIDS. And so he wrote this plan that his church implemented where they would literally go to the darkest places where nobody else was paying attention and he would funnel all those millions of dollars. Staggering. And as a result of that, heads of nations said, will you come in and will you teach our nation the purpose-driven life? Well, if you read the purpose-driven life, it very clearly calls people to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And he got into nations where nobody else could get into. Why? Because he dared to believe that God's blessing was bigger than him. And he was willing to surrender it to God and say, God, however you want to use me, use me. Would you stand with me? I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads with me today because I think God is talking to somebody. And I wanna pray for you because God wants to set you up for a blessing. Irregardless of what your morning looked like, what your week has looked like, what your marriage looks like, what your bank account looks like, God really wants to bless you. But it may be that he brought you here this morning so that you could understand there's a testing before the blessing. With every head bowed and every eye closed before we do that today, I want to give somebody an opportunity today. I want to ask, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you believe in God, but you've never surrendered your life to him, not really. If that's you and today you feel a prompting of the Spirit that, that you want to give your life, nobody's looking around. I just want to see because I want to pray for you. Could you shoot your hand up so I could see it? I want to pray for you. If that is you, if there's anybody here today and you know this is your moment to turn your life over to Jesus and start so God can bless you. Is there anybody in the house today? I'm going to hold just a moment. And if anybody in the back sees anyone, let me know. As every head stays bowed and every eye closed this morning, I, I want to ask you a question this morning. If you're open to the idea that no matter what your life looks like right now, that you're open to, to God coming in and taking over, I'm even talking to saved people and saying, God, I've given you my life before, but today I want to rededicate and say everything that I have, all that I am, I want you to use it for your glory today. If that's you 
and you're ready for a season of blessing, would you just let it be known by the lifting up of your hand? Because I want to pray for you. I'm looking at a house full of people that God wants to bless. Because guess what? We haven't reached everybody in this city. We haven't reached everybody in this state or this country. But God's just looking for somebody to say, God, I'm available. Will you be available? Will you work for him? Will you work for him? He's just looking for somebody to bless. Father, in this room, you see the hands and even more than that, the hearts that are open to you. And God, you know that sometimes we, we get so focused on ourselves. God, we forget we belong to a king and that our lives are not our own, but we've been bought with a price. Therefore, everything that we have, the victories, the defeats, everything belongs to you. God, you know how easy it is. But Lord, today we've been reminded by scripture that you're good and that you're faithful and that even if we're in a, a, a dungeon or a prison or a pit, you can bring us into a palace by your word. So Lord, today, whatever you want, we offer our hearts to you, our minds, our souls. God, come in. Lord, today we rededicate our lives to you because we're going into a season and we know church alive, there's so much destiny on this church and we want to be ready, God. We want to get in on the blessing because you're going to bless this house and you're going to bless somebody and we want to get in on that today. So we know it starts with a surrender. So Lord, today we offer up our hearts we offer up our minds, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasure, everything, God, it all belongs to you. Lord, we thank you because we would have nothing without you, but God, will you take our lives and use them for your glory? In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just ask God that you, as we will go, that you will help us not only to be blessed, to be a ble but also to be a blessing to those around us. Lord, to respond in the generosity and the abundance of what you put in our hands. Lord, whether how little or how much to our perception, Lord, we, make, we trust you that, no, Lord, everything that you place here, everything that you put in our hands, that you put in our path, that you give us a mo the moment to, to, to respond in, to be faithful in, that, you, that we will be found faithful, and that you will find us, Lord, responsive to those in our community with needs, and those that we can support, Lord, locally and globally. And we thank you for the opportunity to worship you in this house today. And we give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Church, have a blessed day.